and the ancestors are looking out for us. They God Hayes is disposable, man. Okay, you see that chair right there? See how big it is? Yeah. Now look at the Pope here under. Scroll down and look at the Pope here under. Never yeah. have it been bad. Yeah. So good. Young TV. Young We running the game right TV. now. Young TV. Time to take over. Into the game, hit that like, hit that subscribe button. If you just not too late, share like on your Instagram, Facebook. If you too late, we broadcast it live from 2030, baby. Uh huh. Taking over the game, baby. Oh, yeah. Young. Hit that light. Young. Get them lights up in the air, you heard me? Young. Ride by. Hotel. It's love. Young. Assalamu alaikum. Flow left. This is for educational purposes only. Alright, where we at Zeke? We left off with Noble Ju Ali crashing the stock market. Now this is volume two. If you haven't checked out volume one, you want to go check out volume one so you can get a better idea of where we're going with this thing. Now, 1929, Noble Drew Ali caused the stock market to crash. We're going to get more into that. In order for you to get the layout and figure out how these killer clouds get down, we got to give you the layout and the background starting with Noble Drew Ali. Now, on volume one, we kind of gave you a breakdown on who the killer clowns are and how they are monitoring the rise of a Nubian Messiah. Anybody that would come to help their people out of the state they're in, in the West, the Hemisphere, in America, Turtle Island. Now, as we get into Noble Drew Ali's story, we'll begin to break down some of the Killer Clown's tactics and the things that were used against Noble Drew Ali to take down his movement. Pretty much assassinate him in 1929. We're going to get into it. Because the Killer Clowns got a tactic called neutralizing. These guys have been around for years and they developed a series of tactics. A lot of them taken straight out of this book, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. They use tactics uh, these, uh, from this book. They use tactics from this book. They, some of their layouts, is some of their tactics is based on uh, this book, The Art of War. So keep that in mind. We're going to talk about uh, one of the first informants that, that the Killer Clowns got from amongst us was the infiltrate Marcus Garvey. Right? One of the, uh, and they always use our own people to infiltrate us. That's the, like the, as I study, because uh, that's what I, I was instructed to do, go back and study all the people the Killer Clowns came out of, how they came out of, what tactics they use. And it seems like if they never had infiltration and informants, they would never, uh, they would never even have none. They never have inf our own people to infiltrate us. If, like, I'm going to make an example for you Bible guys. Uh, they didn't even know what Jesus looked like. These guys that wanted to come out there and have him arrested, they didn't even know what he looked like. He, they had to have somebody that ran with him to, that, to turn him in to the police. And usually, I'm gonna tell you when you when somebody snitching on you, it's usually somebody you ran with. That's why people say I like to do shit by myself. I don't like to go with nobody because ain't nobody gonna be. I ain't gonna tell on myself, right? But niggas go in there and tell on themselves. First forty eight. 
You had a right to remain silent. Anything you say will be used against you. And, and niggas go right up in there and say whatever they say, and that shit is used against their ass, just like they told them. You can't get mad at them, they told you. You had a right to remain silent. Hey, you Anything you say will, keyword, be used against you. Another keyword, against. <laughs> Look up what against means. <laughs> it means it ain't going for your good. Our own people infiltrate us, and this is how these killer clowns get us every time. Everybody, every single person that they took down, some kind of way, somebody, one of their own people that ran with them. Cause people, like, you gotta look at the Bible, like some people, they, they, like I say, it's different perspectives, but you gotta look at certain stories and then play that shit out in reality. Like, so, like, so Judas ran with Jesus. They didn't, like I said, they didn't even know what he looked like. You know what I'm saying? So Judas had to go kiss him and turn him into the, to the people. Right, and they still didn't take them. That's another story. They actually took Judas instead, cause they skipped, cause Jesus hit the shit out of them. But uh, what I mean to say is, the number one tactic for the killer clowns is infiltration and getting them performance. Now let's get more into Prophet Noble Drew Ali's story, right? Thomas Drew, also known as Noble Drew Ali, was born January eighth, eighteen eighty six in North Carolina. Now our master teacher, Dr. Malachi Z. York, put a book out called Who is Noble Drew Ali? A lot of people are saying, dang, Dr. Malachi Z. York put a book out about everything. Yeah, that's right. Now in this book, he goes into a lot of details on the mystery surrounding Noble Drew Ali's life. Now based on all the different data and records and books that we collected to try to find out all the details across references. We have reason to believe that Noble Drew Ali wasn't born on January 8th. We think that he was born in 1886, but he wasn't born January 8th. The reason being is because in the cross references, Noble Drew Ali never give an actual date. He just says that he was born during the time of an eclipse. And then right after that, an earthquake took place and the elders was working the field. Now we went out and looked it up and the only time a solar eclipse took place in 1886 was on August 29th. There wasn't an eclipse during the month of January. Noble Drew Ali also mentioned that it was an earthquake that took place. Now the only earthquake that took place during that time on August 31st happens in Charleston, South Carolina. So in comparison of those two things, it seemed like he had to be born August 31st or September the 1st. And keep in mind, they say that Noble Drew Ali was adopted. That's the same storyline they give for all these extraterrestrials who pop up out of nowhere. One report was that he was an orphan son of two former slaves born in a Cherokee tribe. While another describes him as the son of John A. Drew Quitman, military and political leader of the Cherokee Nation, and Easy Turner Quitman, full-blooded Washita, Tunica mother. One version of his life commonly amongst the members of the Moore Science Temple hold that Drew was raised by his abusive aunt, who once threw him into the furnace. This version holds that he left home at 16 and joined a band of gypsy people who took him overseas to Egypt and the Middle East. Drew also reports working as a circus magician and a merchant seaman before purposely traveling to Egypt. He never received a formal education, but at some point came into contact with Eastern philosophies. Might I point out that the word gypsy comes from the word Egyptian. And they tried to wipe these people out of history by replacing them with Caucasians. These people are Hindu Asian features, the Moors really, who came over here, who can be classified as one of the species of the ancient Egyptians. Cause there were several different people who could be classified or tribes that could be classified as ancient Egyptians. These dark-skinned Hindus, the tribe of Shabazz, came over here and mixed in with us over here. So keep that in mind as we drive farther 
and take you home on Noble Jew Ali's story. Now on his trip to Egypt, they claim that he runs into a man by the name of Salid Jamal al Din al Afghan. Storyline goes that when Noble Drew Ali went to Egypt, he came in contact with this dude who was a master at duck in the uh, Egyptian Catholicism. They try to say that he was the master at duck that taught Madame Borowski. We find that hard to believe because we knew for a fact that El Moroy, the one standing behind Madame Borowski in the picture is the one that schooled him with St. Germain and them up in Canada. And El Moroy is the reincarnation of Azabuk El, the third elder of the 20 and 4, who at one point became disagreeable and decided to teach these people. Now also may I point out, this is the same people that Hitler come under, and Aleister Crowley, and Antoine LaVey, who set up the Satanic Church. So I see the narrator, who is probably the killer clowns, trying to tie Noble Drew Ali in with the Satanic Church and a whole bunch of terrorists. We notice two people that they don't rarely mention who was instrumental in helping Noble Drew Ali on this mission. One of those beings is a being by the name of Deuce Ali. Deuce Muhammad Ali, born November 21st, 1866, was a Sudanese Egyptian actor and a political activist who became known for his African nationalism. He was also a playwright, historian, journalist, editor, and publisher. Ali was born in 1866 in Alexandria, Egypt. Keep in mind, his father, Abdul Salam Ali, was an officer in the Egyptian army. His mother was Sudanese. He received his early training in Egypt, but at the age of nine and 10, his father arranged for him to go to England to be educated. Ali had originally attended to study as a doctor and had started on related studies before his father's death. After his father's death in 1882, at the age of 16, he was forced to return to Egypt to sell the affairs of his father's estate. Ali then returned back to England. Afterwards, he wanted to write and act on completing his studies at the University of London. To make a long story short, Deuce Ali was one of the real guys instrumental in school in Noble Drew Ali. Not some Taliban looking dude. Let's get into Noble Drew Ali also was part of the ancient mystic order of Melchizedek where he went to the pyramid of Cleophas and went through the rituals. Another guy who was instrumental in schooling Noble Drew Ali in the masonry and the science and the alchemy over in ancient Kemet was this guy. Dr. Abdul Hamid Suleiman. Dr. Abdullah Hamid Suleiman Muhammad in his goals to abolish Western Freemasonry from both the European as well as NBC perspectives. He attempted as a 96th right high priest to convert Europeans and NBC Masonry into what he proclaimed as true Masonry and Shrine of Rights. Despite his intentions, this is where his goals come into conflict with the prophets and cause much confusion amongst the Moors in 1913 New Ark, New Jersey. There were also other factors that caused the split, like the dirty Moors, the Zionist Jews, those who look like us, but ain't us, who hide out in New Jersey because they call New Jersey, New Jerusalem. Keep that in mind. But Noble Jew Ali fell out with this dude right here, one of his teachers of the masonry and things, because his teacher wanted to keep things concealed. He was a member of the original ancient mystic shrine. And keep in mind, this started way before the 13 killer clowns on this side, on the Western Hemisphere. This guy felt that European masonry and European shrinery and the Negro masonry was all clandestine. Also to point out an interesting fact, you cannot be a real Shriner if you don't know how to speak Arabic. This guy was fluent in Arabic. He held true to the original Shrinery teachings where he was part of the good 
Sriners who was out to protect the child or to protect the children. He knew the secrets of the mounds and the people over here, the Washita Mound Builders. Where he and Noble Ju Ali fell out at is Noble Ju Ali disagreed with concealing the information and wanted to reveal the information of nationality and birthrights to the people on the land. So this is where the split happened at. From Newark, New Jersey, then Noble Ju Ali went down to Philly where he set up a movement there and then he went to DC and set up a movement there. Then he went to Detroit and set up a movement there. Then he went to Chicago later where he settled, setting up a more science temple there in between 1992 and 1925. Now I know you saying, how does all this tie into the killer clowns? Well just sit back and listen. It's all gonna make clear to you in a minute. Now here's where it get interested at. In 1922, Noble Drew Ali hook up with a bean by the name of Marcus Moses Garvey. We also have reason to believe that they hooked up prior to this and knew about each other prior to 1922. Marcus Moshe Garvey Jr. born August 17, 1887. That's one year after uh, Noble Drew Ali. He was born in St. Annie Bay, Jamaica. He was a Jamaican political activist. He was the founder and first president general of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League, through which he declared himself provisionary president of Africa. The Marcus Garvey ideology is what they term black nationalism and pan-Africanism, which they uh, brought together to create a term for this called Garveyism. Now black nationalism being a misnomer because we're not black, but it goes on to say, especially in the US, why especially in the US? Because in the US corpse is the only place where people name themselves out the crayon. It goes on to say an advocate of our support for union and political self-determination for black people, especially in a form of a separate black nation. So to sum it up, they term black nationalism as in Nubians around the world unifying under one mind and one structure to be free and have their own things around the world. Now on the other hand, Pan-Africanism, almost similar, Pan-Africanism is a worldwide movement that aims to encourage and strengthen bonds of solitary between all indigenous people and diaspora of African ancestry. So to sum it up, Pan-Africanism is the unification of all people of African descent to come together as one nation, as indigenous people to the planet Earth and become uh, this one conglomerate. Also, may I point out, Marcus Garvey started his organization but around the same time as Noble Drew Ali. Marcus Garvey was for black this and black that and let's get the hell out of here and go back to Africa philosophy until in 1922 when he came in contact with Prophet Noble Drew Ali who informed them that no brother we are not black we are Moors and we are indigenous to this land and that they are trying to steal our birthrights. Once Marcus Garvey found out this he went back to try to change his plans. Also right around the same time a guy who was working to influence Marcus Garvey from the background was a being by the name of Walter Plecker who is Ash Star Command. We told y'all about these people with this white hair who can't grow beards. Walter Plecker is a killer clown from outer space. Now here's a picture of Marcus Garvey with Walter Plecker right in the background. What was Walter Plecker influence on Marcus Garvey? It's to promote the black, negro, and color narrative and to promote we Africans to steal our birthrights that we are native and indigenous to this land. Like we say, Walter Plecker was the one involved in paper genociding us to turn us into black Negroes and colors from Muskogee, Washita, Native Americans. We also think that Walter Plecker is a time traveler because you know Ash Star Command is guilty of breaking galactical laws by time traveling. We'll get more into Walter Plecker a little later. Now another thing we want to point out is that Deuce Ali also had influence on Marcus Garvey. In the background, he also was helping them with his movement. 
Another person that was influential in Marcus Garvey's career was Booker T. Washington. In his book entitled Up for Slavery, he goes in about a black man going to an all-white hotel and get rejected services. The white tenant told the black man that this was an all-white hotel. The man proceeded to tell them that I am not black, nor Negro or color, I am Moroccan, and show his identification. Then the white tenant gave this guy a room. In summary, Booger T. Washington said that it's not about the color of being black and dark skin, it's about a status. But it wasn't until Marcus Garvey hooked up with a being by the name of Prophet Noble Du Ali that he started to get on the radar and start to become a threat. Meanwhile, Gay Gahuwu, who had been working his way up since 1917 at the Department of Justice, and as we already pointed out to you, J. Edgar Hoover was a killer clown. Like we say, the Corntel go way back though, even to the time of the prophet Moses. Hence the name Moses for the middle name for Marcus Garvey. Once Marcus Garvey hooked up with Noble Joe Ali and figured out that we were not black, Negro, and colored no more, he really became a threat to national security. And this started J. Edgar Hoover on a campaign to come out to him. The reason why J. Edgar Hoover chose to go out to Marcus Garvey first is because he had more followers. Now with his new message that we ain't black, Negro, and colors and that we indigenous to the land, he could be more of a threat than Noble Drew Ali, being that he had the Pan-Africanism movement already jumping all worldwide, had over a million followers. So what did the killer clowns do? Set up one of their tactics against Marcus Garvey called discrediting. What is discrediting? Harm the good reputation of someone or something. So what Hoover wanted to do? They wanted to discredit him before he could come out with the information that we're not black Negroes in color so that people would listen to him. J. Edgar Hoover, who was a killer clown, used a discredited tactic and ran a smear campaign called Marcus Garvey Must Go. Using famous people that was influential in the black public's view back in that time. You gotta understand that hip hop police go back a long time. They have been following so-called black artists and famous people that make a lot of money for quite some time. So these were people who at first spoke on Marcus Garvey's behalf in a good light. But after JF Hoover collected dirt on them and collected leverage and turned them, he used them as a smear campaign against Marcus Garvey to discredit him. They also spoke out against Marcus Garvey businesses and caused the government to run an investigation on them. Meanwhile, the first black informant, James Wormley Jones, who started out as a police officer, but then was recruited by J. Edgar Hoover and the Killer Clowns in 1921 to infiltrate Marcus Moses Garvey organization and take him down. I know people say James Wormley Jones is the first informant or black FBI agent. But informing go way back. It all starts with a thing called the Manumission Act, where so-called slaves can tell or tattle tell or become snitches on their other homeboys in order to get their freedom. This became a thing that a lot of people chose to do, to snitch, to get their freedom. A lot of this came about during the slave rebellion in the Nat Turner era. And during a time of a being you might never even heard of called Denmark Vesey. They say he started a slave rebellion, but it wasn't a slave rebellion. It was war on the land. Us natives versus those who came that looked like us, but wasn't us. And he also coined the phrase, all skin folks ain't kin folks. Because he knew that the people that was telling on us was our own people under the Manual Mission Act. So who do they need? They needed a so-called black guy to infiltrate other black guys. Gotta keep in mind, we in the hood, we used to stick to a code. When we was hustling, never sell to Caucasians. There was like a street code in the hood, a ghetto code, man. We associated everybody that was Caucasian or so-called white with the police. And these killer clouds overstood that. So this is why they picked people from amongst us to infiltrate us. So like we said, this dude that was a black informant, James Wormley Jones, was used to infiltrate Marcus Garvey and to sabotage him and to do illegal entries on him. 
to where they can set him up for mail fraud and he can be arrested. Watch now, Cointel Pro. In 1922, Marcus Garvey was charged with mail fraud in connection with a ship on the Black Star Line Orion. Further pressure from J. Edgar Hoover, who, J. Edgar Hoover, the killer clown, and his department's investigations, negative press and complaints from stockholders soon led to Garvey gaining a reputation as a swindler. Now here go the smear campaign that I told y'all about, the discrediting that the killer clowns run under their tactics under Cointel Pro. And might I point out, this is the same year that Marcus Garvey kind of got tight with Noble Ju Ali. You gotta understand that Cointel Pro didn't just start in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Cointel Pro go back thousands of years, all the way back to Moses' time. And it goes on to read, Garvey was convicted of the mail fraud charges and sent to Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. While serving his prison sentence, President Calvin Coolidge commuted his remaining time amidst protests from black Americans. You must understand that all this is orchestrated by the Killer Clowns. In the Killer Clowns files, they label Marcus Garvey as an undesirable. It says right here, in the aftermath of World War I, the FBI, the Killer Clowns, began investigating Garvey activities. Listen now, looking to deport him as an undesirable alien. Wow, because he was woke and he was ready to alarm the people after he had got the word from Noble Ju Ali. 1922, they arrested Marcus Garvey, 1927. And in 1927, he got out, and as soon as he got out, the killer clowns deported him straight back to Jamaica, right? And they made sure they put a cap on him to keep him from speaking and interrupting their national security, man. That's what it's about. Keep in mind. So who took down uh, Marcus Garvey, the killer clowns? And they must have gave uh, Marcus Garvey a pass because I believe that he had some connections with the Knights of Templar. This shit is deep, man. You gotta remember about the hot table and the passes and the tokens that they give out. Once J. Edgar Hoover and the Killer Clowns got rid of Marcus Garvey, they started in on Noble Drew Ali in the Moore Science Temple of America in Chicago. Now, one of the tactics they used was infiltration. They started infiltrating the Moore Science Temple in Chicago and the other temples which Noble Drew Ali had set up in Detroit. Philadelphia and DC. Now by this time, Hoover and the Killer Clowns had been watching Noble Drew Ali since 1922. And they even bit down in him real deep once they got Marcus Garvey out the way. Through extensive research, we believe Noble Drew Ali knew he had got infiltrated. So a lot of things he kept secret and didn't tell everybody in the congregation of the Moore Science Temple. Speeding up to 1924, when Hoover really took over, the FBI became director. The Killer Clowns thought they had won until Havana, Cuba, 1928, when Noble Ju Ali and another being by the name of C. Kirkman Bay, who was fluent in different languages, attended the Havana Conference. Boy, the Killer Clowns didn't see this coming. They thought they had sealed the deal. Under their secret treaty of Verona, 1913, Woodrow Wilson fingers America. In 1928, Noble Drew Ali go to Havana, Cuba, and claim the deeds to the property before the killer clowns could claim it under the Shipwreck Act and the abandoned property law. Because keep in mind, they had tried to write us out as black Negroes and coloreds. Now, Noble Drew Ali, Sheikh Sharif Abdul Ali, established the Morris Divine and National Movement in North America, really around 1911, 1912, and officially active 1913. A lot of preliminary work was going on before the movement was initially, or what you call officially, established. So whereas people look at it as the movement starting in 1913, that's the official date of what you say official activity. But the business was going on for quite some time. One of the things I want you to pay attention to and we're not going to go over all those points today, but I want you to look into for yourself because that's not the subject matter, but I want to throw this out there. Look at the timeline. When Drawley established the Moorish Divine National Movement in 1913, 
All right? On the other side of the government, they met and they established the Internal Revenue Service. Um, yes, yes, Federal Reserve System. Now, when Drew Ali was doing his work and about to establish this movement officially, Woodrow Wilson had got his degree at John Hopkins University, his PhD. And he was being, at that time, courted for the election to the presidency of the United States Republic. Now, during the uh, Wilson administration, uh, to counter Noble Dwali, and you must really understand this so you can understand a lot of activities that are going on with a lot of different groups. The point of this mission is the enforcement of our Constitution. Most people's misunderstanding is thinking that the Constitution for the Republic, United States, North America, was established by the European Sons or the Knights. Not true. The number is 35 and 20. 35 Moors, 20 European Sons, in agreement to stop centuries and centuries of wars between the Moors and the Roman nations. And when we say the Roman nations, the Roman nations means the European nations collectively, not just Rome the city. Now, we've had wars since the Punic Wars on up to the Battle of Cru the Crusades, right on, right on up to the Battle of uh, Poitiers, near uh, uh, Tours, France, right on up to the French Revolution and the North American, which they say the American Revolution, but it's North American Revolution, they're all tied together. If you don't know that, know that now. It is the longest revolution in the world. You fell, that's how you became niggers. That's where your slavery really came from. Fact is, that part of history is not taught to separate you from your authority, your self-authority, the empire of the world, and particularly the Moroccan empire in which you're standing right now. Which is also why Drew Ali reminded the Moors before this thing even came, when this thing fell all apart, he says, if you don't do anything else, declare your nationality, be yourselves. Of course, you all know, those of you, you who know law, know that being yourself in law is in propria persona sujuris. All right? So when you see that, you know that that's being yourself. As we already told you, Noble Drew Ali went to Havana, Cuba, claimed the property back from the killer clowns and put it in a trust, locked it in. Man, this really made the killer clowns mad. Go Google Noble Drew Ali's trust and read over that, man. Once Noble Drew Ali did this, the deal was sealed. We had the land back. No more land for the killer clowns. J. Edgar Hoover and the killer clowns had another move in place, and they feel like they need to neutralize Noble Drew Ali at this point. After August 1928, J. Edgar Hoover and the killer clowns started an all-out tactical warfare against Noble Drew Ali in the Moor Science Temple. The different tactics they used were infiltration, division, falsifying documents, murder, sabotage and espionage, false imprisonment, all the way up until neutralizing him. Now, the killer clowns got way more moves than this. On part three, we'll get into breaking some of these moves down in more fine detail. But these were some of the tactics that was used against Noble Du Ali. To take him down using infiltration and division they began to cause a split in the more science temple one of the informants that the killer clowns used and turned against noble Ali was a being by the name of Claude Green Bay now may I point out for all the critics that this image of Claude Green Bay is an AI generated image now the reason for that is because we couldn't find a picture of Claude Green Bay. But keep in mind about the AI. The AI is pretty accurate. We typed in Claude Green Bay on the AI and we did about five takes and it kept giving us the same facial recognition. Another brother that was used by the killer clowns was Low Max Bay. 
who the killer clouds used to cause division amongst the ranks of Noble Drew Ali. These were the two main informants, but they had other informants as well on a lower level, but these two guys were the main two guys to cause division. I mean, just listen at the name, Lomax. And this guy went against all the divine rules of the prophet directly under the orders of the killer clowns. He also committed sabotage and espionage and division amongst the ranks of Noble Drew Ali. The killer clowns used falsified documents and fake letters to send between the members to cause division. These same type of tactics was used against Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. In Malcolm X's case, they sent letters between him and the Nation of Islam to cause discrepancy or division between them. In Martin Luther King's case, they sent him a suicide note. We'll get into that. They also dug up information on Noble Drew Ali to the spread amongst his followers to discredit him and his prophethood. In early 1929, following a conflict over funds, Clyde Green Bay, the business manager of Chicago Temple No. 1, split from the Moore Science Temple of America. He declared himself as Grand Sheik and took a number of the members with him. All this was orchestrated by the killer clowns. A grand shriek, where you get the word sheriff from, is a leader of a Pacific temple, also known as a governor. A shriek also refers to a Pacific head of a tribe or family or a leader in a Muslim community. But to make a long story short, on March 15th, the killer clowns using three women allegedly got Claude Green Bay stabbed up in the Union Hall of the Moore Science Temple on Indiana Avenue in Chicago. Now this was the setup because they were gonna frame Noble Drew Ali for his murder. Meanwhile, the killer clowns used Lomax as a distraction because during the time of the assassination, Noble Drew Ali was out of town dealing with Lomax. And keep in mind, Lomax and Clyde ran together and they were supporters of each other against Noble Drew Ali. When Noble Drew Ali returned to Chicago, the Chicago police arrested him and other members that was a member of his community in suspicion of the murder. Now they know damn well Noble Drew Ali didn't have nothing to do with the murder, but it was a setup just so they can get him in jail and try to kill him. This is the killer clowns you're dealing with. So Noble Drew Ali was out of town. That sound familiar? They used the same tactic against Geronimo Pratt of the Black Panthers when he was out of town during the time of the crime that they accused him of. You already know how the killer clowns get down. When Noble Drew Ali and his people made it into town, they set it up where the Chicago police can get him a good beat down. You know, a Rodney King special and they beat Noble Drew Ali and his followers to inches of their life, supposedly. Also, may I point out Cointel operations dealing with the Chicago police and Fred Hampton. We'll get more into that later. But the killer clowns had the Chicago police to kidnap Noble Drew Ali and throw him in a cell. Now the cell they threw him in, the prior person that was in there was infected with tuberculosis. Noble Drew Ali spent like a week to two weeks in jail, and then he got released. He already had prior injuries while he was in there from the police beating him down. Some say these injuries could have been caused by other people who were informants working for the killer clowns, who had already infiltrated the Moore Science Temple. Shortly after his release at the age of 43, Noble Drew Ali, on July 20th, 1929, passed away at his home. Now, like I say, there's many different stories about how he passed, but there's no doubt in my mind that the killer clowns had something to do with it. Now, after they neutralized Noble Drew Ali, after his funeral, many different beings stepped up to try to take over his throne. Keep in mind, the killer clowns had already infiltrated. So a lot of informants and infiltrators was in the organization and they were tasked to dismantle the organization and to disrupt the teachings of Noble Drew Ali and pretty much destroy them. The killer clowns don't stop with neutralizing, do a thing called dismantling. 
which means to break down or take apart or pretty much divide. It's the same tactic as the division tactic, to take apart and destroy it, to crush it completely so that nobody will ever be able to hear about this black Negro color thing and this more science temple thing. Like we say, rather they assassinated or neutralized Noble Ju Ali, their stock market crashed on October 29, 1929, which they call Black Tuesday. And the reason being, now the laws of London or the killer clowns have been exposed on one side of the mirror because Noble Ju Ali had claimed the property and put it in the trust. Now they had no more collateral for their T-bonds and their contracts which they established to set up this Federal Reserve. So now they had no more land, they changed the game plan by putting the humans up for collateral, like we said, and created what you call human resource. Pretty much turning you into chattel property in the state of Delaware. Now since they lost the land and they had to come up with a plan, the killer clouds disguised the biggest heist in America under President Theodore Roosevelt. Now I ain't even gotta beat it over your head to show you what this guy is all about. There's him right there, Theodore Roosevelt, and that lets you know that he's part of the killer clowns. And like we say, you already know how the killer clowns get down. There's Theodore Roosevelt again, shaking Masonic handshakes with the killer clowns. As you can clearly see, all these guys are in bed together. Like we say, this was the biggest heist in America. Well, under President Roosevelt, he signed the executive order 6102, where he allowed the Federal Reserve to rob everybody of their natural wealth. Because keep in mind, they had no gold. They had no more gold because Noble Ju Ali took the land off from under them. So on May 1st, 1933, Executive Order 6102 requires all persons to deliver on or before May 1st, 1933, all but a small amount of gold coins, gold bullions, gold certificates owned by them to the Federal Reserve in exchange for $20.67, equivalent to $487.2023 per troy ounce. So this was the biggest heist in America pulled off by the killer clowns and their poster boy, Theodore Roosevelt. What? You don't think it was a robbery? Man, they gave you IOU fiat money, toilet paper, in exchange for gold. You might want to look up what's the real definition of money. Commodity money. Shortly after this, they plugged us into the matrix with the social security 10 man number and the all uh, caps. These social securities and birth certificate numbers were to be linked to the Federal Reserve Banks who are privately owned banks. Pretty much making you chattel property owned by these private owned bankers. Human trafficking. To sum it up, modern day slavery. To sum it up, Noble Ju Ali was a problem for the killer clowns. We'll get more into it on part three.